The following program contains mature content about crimes involving rape, murder, and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. Previously on Southern Nightmare. All the M.O. was the same. I mean, the the hand tied behind your back, rope around the neck, the, the purse thrown around the floor. And someone had gotten in through a window, which means almost anyone and everyone is vulnerable. The community was under siege. For months, a maniac had been on the loose, attacking women in their homes, and police had no suspects. They called him the masked rapist. It began in a grocery store parking lot in Arlington, Virginia, at around 1 a.m. on June 27, 1983. A 23-year-old woman was walking to her car from using a payphone when a skinny black man in his late teens or early 20s accosted her, sticking a long knife up into her face. He had a white t-shirt pulled over his head, and his eyes glared out at her from its roughly cut holes. Forcing her into her car at knife point, he ordered her to drive, constantly threatening to stab her. After 15 minutes, he made her pull the car over in an isolated area of Arlington's Green Valley neighborhood. After searching the car's glove compartment for money, he marched her into a nearby forest where he sexually assaulted her and told her to take off her clothes. When she refused, he sliced open her blouse with a knife. Once she disrobed, the man raped her twice without ejaculating. He then told her he was going to go to her car to get something and would return. Thankfully, he never did. She was able to escape after realizing he'd left the scene. A slew of increasingly sadistic attacks would swiftly follow over the weeks and months to come. From True South Media in Richmond, Virginia, in cooperation with Style Weekly and WRIR 97.3 FM, Richmond Independent Radio, this is Southern Nightmare, the story of how the Southside Strangler was brought to justice. I'm your host, Richard Foster. A little over two weeks after the rape and abduction of the woman from the supermarket parking lot, the same masked man broke into another 23-year-old woman's Arlington apartment. Brandishing a 12-inch long serrated knife in his gloved hand, he commanded the frightened woman to bring him her purse. After robbing her, he forced her to perform oral sex on him before raping her. The entire time, he kept up a compulsive patter of death threats and obscenities. If she didn't orgasm, he'd kill her, he said. This would become a familiar story to police as the attacks continued to pile up. As July gave way to August, two separate women had close calls with the masked rapist, narrowly escaping attempted abductions in their cars. Another woman wasn't as fortunate. On August 6, 1983, in the adjoining city of Alexandria, just outside Washington, D.C., the masked rapist forced a 22-year-old woman to drive her vehicle to a wooded area. Once there, he forced her to cover her eyes with silver duct tape before brutally sexually assaulting and raping her for more than two hours. He then introduced another new element to his crimes as he tightly bound the young woman's hands behind her back with rope before marching her back to her car and forcing her into the trunk. After a few minutes, she began smelling smoke. I kicked and kicked as hard as I could, she would later tell police. God must have been looking down because the trunk popped open. When I got out, fire was shooting out of the back seat. Less than two weeks later, on August 17th, he abducted a 27-year-old Arlington woman from her apartment laundry room at Knife Point. This time, he wore socks on his hands instead of gloves. Once back in the woman's apartment, he committed his usual ritual, robbery, threats, sexual assault, and rape. But he also taped the woman's mouth and bound her hands and feet with found items from the apartment, like a belt and a phone cord. He told the woman, his only African-American victim, that he had been looking for a white girl. After two more failed car abductions, on August 28, 1983, the masked rapist climbed into the open window of an apartment belonging to a 29-year-old Arlington woman. He duct taped her mouth and raped her. He also cut the cord from her Venetian blinds. About two weeks later, on September 18th, he would rape a 22-year-old Arlington woman in virtually identical fashion, also entering her apartment through an open window. This time, however, he bound the victim's hands and feet with the Venetian blind cords. He also raped her with a toilet brush handle. If you're like me, at this point, you're thinking, how much longer is this going to go on? And that's sort of the point here. The masked rapist was relentless. 
In just under three months, he had committed six rapes and 10 attacks, and he was showing no signs of letting up, says former county prosecutor Helen Fahey. But he was a one-person crime wave. And unfortunately, the general public was largely oblivious of it occurring because the police weren't going out of their way to alert people. They didn't want to cause a public panic. On October 11th, the masked rapist forced a 45-year-old woman to drive to a remote location in Arlington where he raped and robbed her. He brought Vaseline with him to use as a lubricant. Four days before Christmas 1983, he raped and robbed a 24-year-old Arlington woman after breaking into her apartment through an unlocked window. He had brought a dildo with him this time, a sign of the escalating planning that was going into his attacks. Two weeks into the new year, on January 14, 1984, a 22-year-old Chinese-American woman returned home to her apartment to find the masked rapist waiting inside for her. He robbed her at knife point, but upon hearing her roommate enter the apartment, he fled the scene, leaving behind only a small flashlight. The same night, the rapist had stolen a woman's purse at knife point from her car, but before he could order her to drive, a bystander stumbled onto the scene, causing the attacker to flee. At the time, he was wearing his homemade mask and a cream-colored canvas Eisenhower jacket. Exactly one week later, another woman arrived home to discover the evidence of an unsettling break-in. The cords of her Venetian blinds had been cut and were neatly laid out on her bed alongside pornographic books, carrots, and other items that had been stolen from the house next door. She got lucky, says retired Arlington County homicide detective Joe Horgas. He found sex paraphernalia that he brought over and it was on this lady's bed when she came home. Now, she got home late that day, I think, or something. Uh, but from the crime scene and everything, it looks like he was there waiting and got tired of waiting for her. But if she'd have got home probably an hour sooner or something, she probably would have been the first. The first murder, that is. Because four days later, just a block away, in the same sleepy park-like Arlington neighborhood, Attorney Carolyn Ham was found bound and strangled in the garage of her South 23rd Street home. The same day Ham's body was found, while police were still searching her home for evidence, the mass rapist broke into a house six blocks away, carrying out yet another variation of his by now very familiar MO. The 32-year-old homeowner heard a door open downstairs and went to investigate. She found herself face to face with the masked rapist. Holding her at knife point, he growled, okay, bitch, where's your purse? After grabbing all the cash she had, he carelessly dumped the contents of the purse out onto the floor. Then he ordered her to disrobe and gave her a dildo, which police would later learn he stole from the next door neighbor's house. When she refused to use it on herself, the rapist went crazy, she told police. He hit her in the face repeatedly and slashed her across her right calf with a knife, leaving a four inch scar. He then took her outside, where he made her perform oral sex on him while holding the knife to her eye. He took her out of the house. They went into the backyard. And she doesn't know where they were going. She figured it was going to be to a car or something. Uh, but once she gets in the backyard and she's outside, now remember, he's got a knife. But she's outside, and she said every animalistic, every animalistic uh, something that I had for survival at that time come out, and she started screaming. And he kind of sliced her up with a knife. She had she had sl slashes all over her legs, her arms, uh, but it saved her life. And uh, he ended up jumping over the fence and ran away. And with that. As suddenly as the seven months of attacks had begun, they ended. Within two weeks, police arrested David Vasquez, a mentally challenged fast food worker, and charged him with Ham's murder. When Carolyn Ham's uh, body was found, was there any thought that, that it might be connected to that serial rapist? <laughs> Only by me. Yeah, that's a sore subject. Southern Nightmare will return after this message. Hey, Southern Nightmare listeners, you're going to love this special offer from Audible. They're offering you a free audiobook download of your choice to keep with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. 
They've got over 180,000 titles to choose from, pretty much anything you can think of, from classics to the latest bestsellers. You can listen on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. I'm an Audible subscriber, and right now I'm listening to I'll Be Gone in the Dark, One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer by Michelle McNamara. It's true crime at its best. I highly recommend it. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash southern nightmare. Again, that's audibletrial, A-U-D-I-B-L-E, trial.com slash southern nightmare for your free audiobook. When Carolyn Ham was murdered, Horgus was on vacation visiting family in Pennsylvania. By the time he got back to work, Vasquez had already been identified as a suspect in Ham's murder. Back then, Horgus explained to me, the police department's detective divisions were fairly divided. Horgus's unit handled robberies and homicides. But if a robbery included a sexual assault or rape, like the mass rapist cases did, it instead went to the sex crimes unit. And while everybody had access to the hot sheet or log book of crimes, the units largely ran their investigations independently of one another. Horgus was well aware of the mass rapist cases, and he was the only one at the time who was asking if there might be a connection between those crimes and the ham murder. But Horgus could sometimes be aggressive and intense, and while his fellow detectives respected him, not everyone liked him. In Paul Monis' 1995 book about the case, Stalking Justice, one of Horgus' partners was quoted as saying, Joe and I are friends, but he's a hard person to work with sometimes. He doesn't think of other people too much when he wants to do something or wants something done. He doesn't think about how the people are feeling or anything like that. It's what he wants now and do it now, and he tends to piss a lot of people off the way he comes across. Another officer said, Joe's an abrasive personality. A lot of people don't like Joe. A lot of people like Joe. I don't think there are very many people in between. None of the other detectives bought into Horgus's theory about a link between the ham murder and the masked rapist. I mean, that was always in the back of my mind. Only it, it kind of went away after they locked up David Vasquez. Uh, and, you know, everything stopped. So everybody assumed, well, you know, we got the right guy. I mean, you understand, everything stopped. Once, once, once they locked up Vasquez, everything stopped. So, you know... Uh, they knew Vasquez wasn't the the mask rapist because he wasn't. The, they knew that was a black guy. David Vasquez is not black. He's he's Hispanic, but he's not black. And so basically, I told my sergeant, I says, "Look, look at the ammo. Look, look at all this stuff this guy's done. And what a coincidence that within a couple blocks of Carolyn Ham's murder, uh, somebody seen outside the window and it matches this guy's description and all that. What well, you feel that strong? Send a telecite." <laughs> I said the teletype. <laughs> it's all the surrounding jurisdictions, basically, you know, and, and nothing happened with it. Essentially, Joe Horgus was like that character in the movies who's the only one who knows the aliens are invading or that spies have infiltrated the government, and no one will listen to him. I just can't believe, because, I mean, I work with all these people. I, I just can't believe that I saw something that, that they just ignored. Flash forward to nearly four years later, in early December 1987. Joe Horgus was more convinced than ever that not only had the masked rapist killed Carolyn Ham, he had also murdered Sue Tucker. Horgus had poured through all the old case files, and the connection seemed as clear as day to him. But that would also create a problem for his department, because it would mean that David Vasquez was an innocent man. And then, on Tuesday, December 8th, 1987, a week and a half after Sue Tucker's murder, Orgus would learn that the masked rapist had another alias, the Southside Strangler. My sergeant uh, had a teletype laying on, on my desk. It was from Richmond. And I don't know which one it was, but it was with the MO and everything. So I called down there and I talked to uh, Glenn Williams. We compared cases and we decided we got to get together the teletype had been sent out by Glenn Williams, who with his partner Ray Williams was one of the two Richmond homicide detectives working the Southside Strangler murders. The teletype read, for police information only, not for press. This department is investigating two homicides. The first occurred on 9-18-87 around midnight. A white female, 35, was found in her apartment on 9-19-87 at 0940 hours. She had been bound with her hands tied behind her back. She had also been raped. 
The apartment was entered through an open rear window with the screen closed. The suspect raised the screen and entered the apartment. There was no sign of any struggle in the assault or the murder. On 10 140 hours, the victim, white female, 32, was found in her bedroom. The house was entered from a second story window that was opened, but the screen was closed. The screen in this case was cut out and laid on the second story porch. In both cases, the victims were strangled to death. Any department with similar case, please contact Richmond Bureau of Police or Detective Glenn D. Williams. Thanks for your help in advance. As soon as he finished reading the teletype, Horgus called Glenn Williams, who had a few more surprises to share from the Richmond investigation, including the fact that the strangler was also believed to have recently killed a 15-year-old high school freshman in Chesterfield County, just the week before Sue Tucker was murdered. Additionally, Glenn told him, the department had sent the semen samples from the murders up to a private lab in New York for a new process called DNA fingerprinting to see if they could definitively match the killings. Horgus knew virtually nothing about DNA testing except that he had heard it discussed by Arlington prosecutor Helen Fahey as a possibility to be considered in the Tucker murder. Glenn Williams also told Horgus that FBI profilers believed that the Southside Strangler was a white male in his 20s to 30s. When Horgus began briefing Glenn about the strangulation murders of Sue Tucker and Carolyn Ham, Glenn initially wasn't seeing the connection. Why would the killer strike 100 miles to the north? The FBI said he was probably a local Richmond guy. When Horgus asked if Richmond had reports of any other incidents in the Southside neighborhoods where Debbie Davis and Dr. Susan Hellams were murdered, Glenn replied, well, we do have this black guy running around doing some shit. At 3 a.m. on November 1st, he told Horgus, a 32-year-old woman in Westover Hills was startled awake in the bedroom of her first-floor apartment by a black man wearing a ski mask and work gloves. She described him as being in his late 20s with a muscular build. Holding her at knife point, the intruder ordered her to disrobe and take a shower. He then forced her to down half a bottle of Southern Comfort whiskey. He had brought the whiskey with him in a bag tied to his waist, along with a vibrator and rope, which he used to bind her hands. The attacker raped and assaulted her for three hours. Then he started to bind her ankles. The woman's frantic cries drew the attention of her upstairs neighbor, who came to check on her. The rapist escaped through the kitchen window, taking some of the young woman's accounting textbooks with him, which he dropped as he ran away. Horgus was flabbergasted, to say the least. He told Glenn about Arlington's mass rapist cases from 1983 to 1984, but Glenn remained skeptical that it could be the same perpetrator. Still, Glenn told Horgus that if he wanted to get more information about the Richmond cases, he could come down and attend their weekly task force meeting the next morning. Horgus immediately got permission from his sergeant to travel to Richmond with another detective. So we went down for their, their meeting the next day. And we brought all our pictures, and they had all their pictures, and we compared it. It didn't take much of a brain to see that everything's everything's done by the same guy. Even though it's 100 miles apart, uh, you know, what are the odds that there's a guy killing our women this way, and he's killing this woman up in Arlington the same way? However, from Joe Horgus's perspective, the Richmond cops initially treated him like a podunk small-town detective who didn't have their breadth of experience. I mean, the first day I met them, you know, they, uh, we, you know, we only had a couple homicides a year, and they had seventy or eighty a year, and so, you know, how how dare I even I, I even put any input into the game? Retired Richmond homicide detective Ray Williams disputes Horgus's take on the meeting. That's not true. We made the point not to do that. You know, you don't want to come across as I'm the big homicide city homicide detective because that would turn him off. But no, I don't ever treat him with disrespect. This is probably as good a time as any to mention that there's no love lost between Ray Williams and Joe Horkus. They were both smart, dedicated, successful homicide detectives. And this was the biggest case of both of their careers. But they also possessed big personalities and egos that clashed. Even 30 years later, both of them have great fun taking pot shots at each other behind their backs. However, Ray and Joe agree that by the end of that December 1987 meeting, the Richmond Task Force accepted that the Arlington murders had probably also been committed by the Southside Strangler. We came in with the bad notes and photographs and all. We all agreed it was the same person. 
The knowledge that the Strangler was killing women in both Richmond and Arlington let law enforcement know the danger was even greater than they'd realized. But it didn't bring detectives in Richmond or Arlington any closer to finding a suspect. And so, the investigation stalled for another few agonizing weeks while they hoped for a break in the case before the Strangler could kill someone else. And we're approaching Christmas, and uh, we're approaching the meeting with the FBI because that's the most significant part of this investigation. And why is that? Because they're the ones that told me how to find who the suspect is. Southern Nightmare will return after this message. Southern Nightmare is an amazing podcast. It's doing true crime in a way that centers victims and their families and actively works not to glorify the murderer at the center of the story. It's cognizant of its place setting and how the setting affects what happens and how people respond. And it's a great dive into Richmond history and some of the people who make it awesome, like Dr. Marcel Fierro. Boom. That's three reasons to listen to it right now. That was Southern Nightmare fan Cassidy reading some of the tweets she's written about the podcast. We really appreciate all the great comments we're getting from listeners like Cassidy on social media and iTunes. Keep telling your followers about Southern Nightmare. I also want to thank everyone who's contributed so far to our Patreon page. I want to give a big thank y'all to Jeff Gardner, Chris O'Hearn, Julie Cook, Melanie Barker, Lillian Peters, Susan Franks, Christina Wright, Julia Brown, and Virginia Morell. We need the financial support of listeners like you to keep Southern Nightmare going for another season. And if you donate now, you can get access to exclusive content like extended interviews and our one-hour live show. Donate today at southernnightmare.com slash donate. On December 29, 1987, Steve Mardigian and Judson Ray, agents with the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, met with Horgus to establish an updated behavioral profile on the killer, given the new information from the Arlington rapes and killings. Judson Ray and Steve Mordigan from the FBI came up to Arlington County Police Department, and I had, in the conference room, set up everything. It was my traveling show, you might say, that I had put together all the rapes, uh, and this is before it was on. We didn't know who the suspect was, but basically, it, I had put together everything that I had to show from the M.O. that whoever was the rapist was the killer. Okay, there were a lot. We we were observing there were a lot of behavioral similarities between the Northern Virginia case and the, and the Richmond cases. That's retired FBI profiler Steve Mardigian. Once Horgus laid out all the information from the cases, he says, it became clear that the 1983 to 84 cases were also committed by the South Side Strangler. And boy, we, we saw some striking similarities there. Then, so, if the masked rapist and the South Side Strangler were the same person, then why did the FBI at first say that the Strangler was likely a white male? To answer that question, you have to go back to the origins of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, which was founded in 1972 by FBI agent Robert Ressler. At the time of the Southside Strangler's 1987 killings, it had only been about 10 years since Ressler and fellow agent John Douglas began their pioneering research into serial killers, interviewing offenders like Edmund Kemper, who brutally murdered 10 people, including his own grandparents. These early prison interviews had one factor in common, all the serial killers they talked to were white. In fact, Steve Mardigian and Judd Ray both told me that the first black serial killer they were aware of was Wayne Williams, who was convicted in connection with the 1979 to 81 Atlanta child murders, a case that Judd Ray worked. It was thought in the unit that serial killing was largely a phenomenon carried out by white males. As we now know, that's simply not the case. Serial killers aren't restricted to one race or even gender. Human beings of every race and creed have the capacity for great acts of kindness as well as immeasurable cruelty. The amount of melanin in one's skin has nothing to do with whether someone turns out to be a good person or a monster. In fact, the two best-known serial killers whose M.O.s have the most in common with the Southside Strangler are the Golden State Killer and BTK, both of whom are white males. But in 1987, the FBI's fledgling behavioral science unit had to make its conclusions based on what it knew at the time, says Dr. Lewis Schlesinger, a professor of forensic psychology and an expert on serial killers at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. 
in the early to mid 70s they just began doing it it was um around uh 86 88 i think that um they first the fbi was first started publishing some articles on this so it was and then there was only a few group few people doing this you know in the fbi you know more than three or four or five people so you know you got to give a lot of credit to the early folks doing this but you can't hold them to today's standards 2018 what they were doing in the mid 70s we learn as as yeah. you, as you gain experience you learn and, and then you change your methods change your techniques and we're, we're continuing to learn as well in 1987 the fbi's behavioral science unit was made up of about eight people and the prevailing theory at the time was that it was rare for murderers, and especially serial killers, to prey on victims of a different race. Absent any witnesses or physical evidence pointing to the Southside Strangler's race, it was thought that a serial killer murdering white victims would also most likely be white. You do the same thing with uh, characteristics like age. You, you, you go for the, uh, the norm if you don't have evidence to support it other way, and you know you base it on uh, what your prior experience has been. And of course, like you said, uh, the whole process was in its, uh, you know, beginning, uh, in the beginning field, at the beginning field of endeavor. So, to a lack of forensic evidence to the contrary, we would have, we would have probably deferred at that stage to, you know, what the intelligence has shown us. It would have been, you know, white on white, black on black, so to speak. And we probably, I think, in our call, that's what I think it was, profile as a white male. Is that aspect of it? Huh? And of course, that uh, you know, we wouldn't certainly have said that if we'd known there had been forensic evidence to the contrary. Now armed with a more extensive criminal history for the Southside Strangler, including detailed accounts of his MO from rape survivors, the two FBI profilers were able to come up with far more accurate insights into how they might catch the serial killer. They spent about an hour or two looking over everything. And the short story is, uh they ended up agreeing with me that uh, they, they, they think this mass rapist is the killer. And they said, we're going to go one step further. If this first case that you have, the one where he found the woman at the phone booth and made her drive him down to Green Valley, if that's the first case, then where he took her to He's going to live within a two-block area of, of where he took her to. Additionally, Steve Mardigian and Judd Ray concluded that when he was acting as the masked rapist, the Strangler wouldn't have stopped committing rapes and murders on his own accord. Instead, they said it was far more likely that he'd been jailed for another offense between 1984 and 1987. Maybe it was possible, they theorized, that he had recently been paroled to a halfway house. We, we pulled probation parole records looking for anybody that got out of prison that would have lived in that area we i mean we also asked richmond to do the same stuff uh but we're looking and, and whether he lived in that area or not from the probation and parole stuff we're looking for someone who got locked up after carolyn ham was killed and who was out prior to uh davis being killed down in richmond Joe Horgas asked his fellow officers if they could think of any suspects from the historically African-American Green Valley neighborhood who might be their guy. And he also started thinking back to his own days working cases in that area. Green Valley was my expertise. I mean, I used to, I used to catch all the robberies and everything from down there because I had snitches down there. I, it, was my, <laughs> it was my, what, forte, I guess. I mean, I, I, was, I was just good with them people down there. One day, while parking his car in the Green Valley area, a young man's name came into Horgus' head out of nowhere. Joe had arrested him as a juvenile back in around 1975 or 1976, but he couldn't recall more than his first name. He still doesn't know what exactly it was about the kid that made him think of him. All I can remember was Timmy. All I can remember was Timmy. Yeah, when I first met Timmy, he was probably... I don't know, somewhere around 13, 14 years old. And uh, I was uh, working burglaries at the time. And I believe he was one of several kids that broke into somebody's house. I know I talked to his mother to, I had to get permission to get his fingerprints. I don't even remember if we made him by prints or, or, or if, you know, the kids 
talked on one another or, or, or what, but I, I know I had to get uh, his fingerprints through the permission of his mom, and uh, that's, that's really about the time I met him. Back at the office, Timmy's full name was on the tip of Joe Horgas' tongue, nagging at the corners of his brain. And as he was sitting at a conference table with another detective going over records, it came to him. And we're, we're, we're comparing names against each other, and all of a sudden, Timmy Spencer's name popped in my head. I finally remembered. Now, that doesn't mean it's him. It just means it's another one to put into the pile. But then when we ran him in the computer, and we found out that he was arrested in Alexandria for a burglary right after Carolyn Ham was killed. What happened uh, over there was uh, Timmy was was seen coming out of one house and going into the other house. Ne- neighbors saw him coming out of, he had broken into one house and they were getting ready to go into the other house. When they called the police, the police caught him red-handed. And so when you look at the incident report and you see what the evidence they had there. I mean, the rapist, uh, he, he always had something on his hands. Well, Timmy's socks were not, were not on his feet. He, number one, he had Puma sneakers on. And in one case on Greenbrier Street, uh, he raped a lady and uh, I think her husband came home from work or something in the early stages, maybe in August or something of 83. Uh, and he escaped by jumping out the bedroom window, or bathroom, I figure it was on window. But there was a Puma sneaker track left. Uh, well, he's wearing Puma sneakers. His socks are not on his feet, they're in his pockets. He's wearing a tan Eisenhower jacket, which is what the rape victims described the mass rapist is wearing. Uh, this was all deserving of, of, of more looking into. You with me? So we called probation parole to find out where he's at. Well, turns out he's still in the prison system, but he's in a halfway house down in Richmond. And then we go down to Richmond and we go to the halfway house and we find out that he signed himself out of the for every murder down there, and he got a furlough to come up to Arlington for the Susan Tucker murder. So everything just seems to fit the puzzle. The pieces are all coming together now. Next time on Southern Nightmare. The choice was, do you take the chance on leaving someone you believe is a serial murderer on the street? Southern Nightmare is a production of True South Media in cooperation with Style Weekly Magazine and WRIR 97.3 FM, Richmond Independent Radio. New episodes are released every Tuesday. It's recorded at Sound of Music Recording Studios in Richmond, Virginia. Our producer is John Morand. Original music by Daniel Davis. For exclusive extra web content, visit our website at southernnightmare.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to leave a positive review on iTunes. It helps people find us. We'd like to give special thanks to everyone who gave their time to talk with us for this podcast and to you for listening. Pleasant dreams.